Hey friend, we've got an action-packed broadcast for you today. I can waste no time. We are in the book of John, chapter number 21. John 21, we're asking the question today, how did the seven disciples sitting there on a boat trying their best to catch fish when Jesus Christ, in verses 2, 3, 4, 5, when he saw them and said, children, have ye any meat? And they said, no. He said, cast the net on the other side of the boat. And it was so full, they couldn't pull it in. At what point was it? What caused them to recognize? Recognize Jesus. We're in verse number four of chapter 21. The Bible says, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. We asked the question was his presence? evident. Was it his presence that betrayed him to them? We don't believe it was because they saw him, but that wasn't enough. Was it his posture? Well, we see the standing Jesus in verse number four. We could easily spend hours just on this position of his posture. But as we ask the question, do you know him? Let me tell you, friend, that suffice it to say, one of my favorite moments when Jesus stands in all of scripture, we could look at so many opportunities these so many passages, but Acts chapter 7, verse number 55, but he, that Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Pause there for just a moment. Yesterday on the broadcast, I gave you about a half dozen verses that prove that at this very moment, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father. We talked about his seated posture, but right here in verse number 55, Stephen even saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, verse 56, and said, Stephen did, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Oh, friend, let me tell you, we've already read those half dozen verses about Jesus sitting down on the right hand of the Father, but we know that Psalm 116, 15 tells us that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And when Stephen was on the verge of death, he got to see Jesus give him a standing ovation and an open hand to welcome him home. Now, we've talked about the different postures of Jesus. We see him here in verse 4 of John 21 standing on shore, but I believe his presence and his posture wasn't enough to cause them to recognize. Let's find out, was his proclamation Enough. Look at verse number, let's see, verse number five. Then Jesus, John 21, verse five, then Jesus saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. There's no recognition. They don't say, oh, I think that's Jesus. They just answer him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. They still don't recognize him. They cast, therefore, they still haven't realized who they're talking to. So no, I don't believe his proclamation was enough. But then we see in verse number six, he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find they cast therefore. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Was it his power extraordinary? That's the question for you today. Was his presence enough? Did his posture expose him? Maybe his proclamation was enough. Was it his power extraordinary? Before we dive into that question of how did they know him, let me point out his power. I'm so glad to see that in God's economy, he gives you more than you can handle. Honestly, we could sing his praises for 10,000, 100,000 years, and we'd just be hitting our our stride. First Chronicles 29, 11, thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. But can I tell you, in this mystery, in this search for what really calls the disciples to realize who it was, who they were talking to, I believe we must take one more step forward because I don't believe it was totally his presence. I don't think it was completely his posture. I don't believe it can be encapsulated in his proclamation, and I don't believe his power by itself was enough. At the end of the day, all of those things may have helped, but... I believe and I submit to you that I think it was their previous experience. Do 
you know him by your previous experience. God, in this passage, was kind enough to allow them to recall a previous experience. You remember earlier in the Gospels where they're toiling all night and God says to them from the shore, he says, have you caught anything? They say no. He says, try one more time. And Peter being Peter, he's probably very similar to me. He had to give one more go, one more I told you so, one more reason. He said, we haven't caught anything all night. Nevertheless, at thy word, we'll try it. I wonder if in these moments in John 21, if they remembered what it was like last time Jesus was giving the fishing instructions. Now, I realize, friend, we are a reactionary people. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible commands us to remember now thy creator. Can I encourage you to remember the previous experiences of God's goodness? My question is, do you know him or how do you know him? I'm not asking if you even now are feeling the presence of the Lord or if his proclamation in, is stirring in your heart and soul or if you have some spooky feeling of his power. I'm asking, do you know him? Do you have any previous experience with him? Would you like to know how I know him? By that which he has done for for me previously. You say, he hasn't done much for me. I ask you, you're breathing right now, aren't you? Who do you think gave you that breath? Breath. I can't help but notice that nary a one of us are starving at this moment. Who do you think gave you the means to purchase that sustenance? Can I tell you the reason that we so seldom see God work is because we are too busy taking credit when he does until he, Christ Jesus, becomes king of your life, and yes, I'm speaking to you as a Christian friend, you will never realize the goodness that he has graced you with. For as long as you inhabit the throne of your life, you will never even pause to remember the past and previous experiences of God's goodness. I ask again, do you know him? If you don't, maybe it's because you think it's your kingdom. Maybe you think all good things have begun with you. Let me tell you about my king. And let me ask if you know him. There was a man many years past, a passionate preacher of the gospel. His name was S.M. Lockridge. If you've never had the opportunity to listen to him talk about his king, I encourage you to type in S.M. Lockridge, that's my king, or he's my king, and look it up maybe on YouTube sometime. Let me give you just a little taste of S.M. Lockridge's uh, often preached message that really stirred the hearts of God's people. Listen now and consider for yourself whether or not you are king of your life, or if he is king of your life. Listen now. Mr. Lockridge said, my king was born king. The Bible says he's a southern way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's an ethnic king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Now, that's my king. Well, I wonder if you know him. Do you know him? Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is the only one of whom there are no means of measure that can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of the shore of his supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. King. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone 
in himself. He's honest. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the grandest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy, and he's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of historic theology. He's the carnal necessity of spiritual religion, and that's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He's the almighty God who keeps all his people. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharged debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble, he blesses the young, and he serves the fortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent and the beautifies the meek. That's my king. Do you know him? Well, do you? Well, my king is the king of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness, the highway of holiness, the gateway of glory, and he's the master of of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors, the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislator, and he's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of peace. He's the king of kings, and he is the lord of lords. That's my king, and my question once again resounds, do you know him. I cannot do justice to Mr. S.M. Lockridge's amazing oratorical abilities, but I can ask again, do you know him? If you're listening, if you're under the sound of my voice right now, and you have no previous experience with him, can I ask you, when are you going to stop searching? When are you going to stop desiring that peace and start finding it at the feet of Jesus? Can I encourage you, Christian friend, if you have forgotten the previous experiences, the previous answers to prayer, the previous goodness of God, let me encourage you to start with your salvation. Ask the Lord to help remind you that he's never left his people lacking bread. One of the greatest sins of Christianity is that of a short memory. I ask you, do you know him? Did God forget you this past year? Did he fail you in the past 12 months? Was he slack towards you? No. Can you trust him this upcoming year? Can you uh, trust him this month, this week, today? Yes, you can. And I ask again, do you know him? Can I tell you, friend, he's still sitting at the well, he's still standing on the shore, and he's still right beside you, and I ask one more time, do you know him? I so greatly appreciate your attentiveness. I appreciate with the abundance of information that was communicated, the fact that you would tune your ears to this broadcast today. My prayer is that you have a great day for his glory. Have a special treat for you next week. Please listen in. God bless. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes, a ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of all of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. That's 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 188 Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. A faster way to contact us is to go to our website at BibleTracksInc.org. That's BibleTracksInc.org. There you will find more information about our ministry and details on how you can support Bible Tracks Incorporated. Thanks for listening, and may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.